Thank you all for being here today. Um, so what my wife and I are doing now, sort of full time, other than showing up and preaching four verses on a Sunday here like I did last week, uh, is something we're calling Revere Network. And so we launched a, a, a platform just a couple of months ago with our, our staff that we brought from, from California that are still working with us. And um, so we're on YouTube. We post, you know, sort of a 15, 12 to 15 minute video every week on Sundays typically, Saturday or Sunday. And then we're doing some other things through the week. And we're also uh, on Facebook and then, and then on TikTok. And what TikTok has sort of become is more of a free market on social media because the other platforms really sort of manipulate their algorithms a lot. And so what you're getting on TikTok is pretty, pretty raw and pretty, pretty fresh. And it's much, for us, it's much smaller clip. So I wanted to show you just a video that we put up just a day and a half ago. And in about 18 hours, this video had 14,000 views and over 3,000 likes. And so, and, you know, and then some, we're getting a lot of good feedback. So the, the passion of our heart, if you haven't figured it out yet, and if you're new, you, it'll maybe take, take through today. But, you know, it's funny that Sam mentioned being in a Baptist church because he's never been inside a Baptist church in his life. <laughs> but some of us know what that's like. And not to disparage Baptists, that's how a lot of us got saved. But, um, but our passion from about 12 years ago has been to introduce people to Jesus the way the Bible teaches him, not the way religion presents him, not the way, you know what, not the way our insecurities present him to us, but Jesus Christ wants you to know that he loves you completely just the way you are right now. The, the catch, as we all know, is you probably won't stay the way you are right now. But here's the other catch that people seem to struggle a little bit with, and that is that he loves the world just like that. And the only hope for people that aren't believers to ever become a believer in Christ is not to know what they're doing wrong because they could probably figure that out without you. It's to know that Jesus loves them the way they are. The only thing, the only hope the world has is for, for the church to represent God the way the Bible lays out in the New Covenant. And, and so that's just been our passion. So let me show you this quick video and then I want to read to you a couple of comments that we've been getting over the last uh, few days. And I tell you, if you're a child of God, you're never going to wake up in hell. You might live like hell here. You might feel like hell here, but you're not going to go to hell. If you don't know Jesus, then here's how simple that is right now. You can believe on the Lord Jesus, and you and your house shall be saved, is what Paul the Apostle, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, told the Philippian jailer. If you can believe, then today is your day of salvation. It's that simple. So that video just right there is just a little clip of a, of a longer video that we posted on, uh, on YouTube last week. And right now, as of this morning, there's over 16,000 views on that video right there. Why is that? Because that's not a message that you hear in church. And the reason is, is because that message right there is not going to fill up an altar when we're done here today. And the only way you can do that with believers is to make them think that maybe something that they did this week or last night or yesterday or last month has put their salvation in question. Now, a lot of us are, are parents and grandparents, and we know that nothing could ever change our love for our children. I mean, I don't think this is a, a thing here. Uh, cause I don't, but I don't know everybody that well yet, but in California, there was a number of people in our church that would leave after Sunday service and head to a state prison. There was a bunch of them out there. And they would go there to those prisons to visit their children. And I would ask them, what do you, what, what's the, I mean, you know, I mean, I get it. You're visiting your kid, but what do you say to them? And the response is always the same. I want them to know that I love them and that I'll never leave them, never forget about them, and never give up on them. But yet, what the church has become good at is, is playing with that where Jesus is concerned, where we, we want to hold a tension between, oh, God loves you, but don't take him off. Anybody ever been there? 
It's called religion. And that's what we're tapping into in this, in this platform, and people are starting to, to respond. Now, this has gotten me uninvited to every, literally every church I've ever preached in except my own. And since I founded this one, then this qualifies as my own. So I don't get kicked out of this one. And I'm not, also not the senior pastor, so that makes it easy on, on you and me, I guess. But it says this, one person just said, addicted to this account. Another person said, praise God, I found you. You are unwinding a bunch of lies right now. Can I actually be free, question mark? Dying a thousand deaths of guilt over here. So people are bound when God wants us to be free. Somebody else uh, posted, wow, I've been a Christian for five decades, but I've never felt like one. Thank you for this message. I'm tired of worrying about if I'm saved or not. Isn't that crazy? See, God is a forever God. And when you give him your heart, he takes it forever. He wants you to know that you're free in him. Well, yeah, Pastor Ken, I, I get it. I mean, I'm free to do the right thing. Refer back to my previous comment about having kids. They don't just do the right thing, do they? They do the wrong thing sometimes. And my kids were no different, and they, they weren't terrible, but they certainly weren't angelic. <laughs> but they were always loved. And so that's, that's sort of the passion of our heart and our mission um, on, on the platform, and I think that's a big reason why, you know, God changed our season so that we could focus a, a little bit more specifically on that all the time. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. I made you a promise that I'm going to try to keep, uh, and I said that if you'd come back today, which a lot of you did. How many of you were here last week? Okay, so you all know my promise then that I'd be done by 11.05, because I went a little long last week, which... It happened, you know, when you have one service, there's some, you feel some freedom in that. I mean, there was five years of our pastorate where we did four Sunday mornings in a row for five years uh, and always did at least three. So you can't take much liberty in those situations. You've got to be on time because you've got to clear the parking lot, basically. But last week, we started Ephesians 1 and, and just verses 3 through 14. And so we're, we're going to pick up there today, and, and we'll get into high gear here and get on with the message. But just remember that last week we learned that he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. He chose, he chose you without you having anything to do or say about it. He liked you from the beginning. He loved you from the beginning. You're chosen. You know, my daughter, you'll meet her at some point, um, Eve had her before we met. She was three months old when I met the two of them together. I met them at the same time. And then in five weeks, we were engaged. Five months, we were married. And then as soon as we got married, I adopted Amanda. And so, you know, we knew that, because everybody knew in our family, everybody knew. So we were going to tell her someday. And, you know, I was driving to work. We're in our first uh, ministry assignment. I had been been out of the Marine Corps for maybe, you know, a year and a half, to, well, probably about three years by then, because we'd finished Bible college, and I was driving to work one morning, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me that it's time to talk to Amanda, so I called Eve, because there were no cell phones in those days, and I said, hey, I'm going to take Amanda out tomorrow night, because it was Wednesday, we had church that evening, and I said, I'm going to tell her, you know, it's time, I feel God spoke that to me, and she said, okay, cool, and they didn't come to church that night because Samuel was a baby and Josiah was little and it was, you know, midweek. So uh, she kept them home. And that night, Amanda said, Mom, were you married before? And she said, well, no, honey, why do you ask? She said, because I'm in your wedding pictures. She was, I don't know, six maybe, seven, going on 37, of course. If you've got girls, you know how that goes. And uh, so he was able to explain the whole thing to her. So it was just interesting, the timing of the Lord. You know, when you're sensitive to the Spirit of God, it's amazing how he shows up. And so the next night I took her on a date. And the big thing that I told her is, babe, I didn't just pick mommy, but I picked you. See, being chosen 
is a big deal. Ask any psychiatrist. Ask any therapist. Being wanted is a big deal. And the, it's easier this way. <laughs> and the Bible says you and I were chosen in him before the foundations of the world. It goes on in verse 5 to say he predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters by Jesus Christ to himself. You know, adoption in Roman days is different than it is today. It was more honorable then because you were selected specifically to be part of a lineage. If you're a, a woman, you were selected to have babies in that lineage. If you were a man, you were, you were chosen because there was no heir or no leader in that lineage to carry on the name. And so it was a place of honor. So in, in our culture, we, we sometimes can look at it as a diminished role or position but God wants you to know that it's a position of honor he chose you specifically to be in his family that's what this means so he predestined us as children you know I'm not a Calvinist because I don't think it makes sense because I don't think God chose some people to go to hell I think like any good parent he chose everybody to be successful and go to heaven you know, we all choose our kids to do great things. Oh, look at little Johnny's an astronaut. Look at him. You can just tell. I know he's only three, but but Johnny better be good at physics and math if he's going to be an astronaut. So somewhere down the line, you've got to cooperate with the dreams of the father. I believe that's what the whole revelation of blotting people's name out of the book of life. I believe every human being that's ever been born is already in the book of life. As a predestined thought of the Father. Everybody's got to receive Christ. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying his idea is he wants everybody there. I have a hard time thinking that a God that loves people would choose some to go to hell from the get-go when he chose us in him without us ever doing anything. So we moved on and said that also in verse 6, that he made us accepted in the beloved. So we see all these things that speak to really challenges that humanity has today because they don't know him. They don't know that they've been chosen and accepted and predestined to be sons and daughters. They see him as some detached, angry grump that really would rather not have them around. And then we move on here in verse number 7. And this is where we'll pick up today. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Redemption in his blood because of the riches of his grace. Now, the cool thing is, is because of his blood, we are forgiven. 1 Corinthians says that the reason we know we are forgiven is because Jesus was resurrected. It's awesome that he died for us, but... The resurrection had to happen. It says it in reverse that if Christ is not risen, then we are still in our sins. So the reverse is also true that because he is risen, we are no longer in our sin. Because of his blood. Verse 8, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. You ever hear people say, well, you just never know about God. Well, just, you just don't know. We just don't know. Not according to this. It said he made known unto us the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I mean, there's a lot of layers to that onion, but he's not keeping anything from us. He wants you to know. He wants us to know. If you notice the verbiage here, he's doing it all. None of it depends on our effort. He's, he took care of all this on our behalf without our help. You know, some, some moms don't like to teach their kids how to cook. Because they don't want them in there making a mess while she's trying to get dinner ready. Or he, you know, if a father is doing the cooking. God wants participation. It's messy, but that's how, that's how we learn. Uh, 
so he made known to this because he purposed in himself, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So again, notice that he's just doing so much on our behalf, and, and you have now been given an inheritance, and it's better than any earthly inheritance. And inheritances are important, right? I mean, we, we wouldn't know Paris Hilton's name if she wasn't an heir to somebody that had a bunch of money. She never accomplished necessarily anything to get all that. She was just born into a family. See, you were born again into a family, but that inheritance was set aside for you from the beginning of the foundations of the world. You see, this benevolence that God has for you is uncanny. In fact, I could even say that you are his favorite child, except for me. <laughs> yeah, and Jason. <laughs> You know, I've, and this is silly, of course, but I think we shouldn't take ourselves too serious. But all over the world, I've asked people, who is the disciple Jesus loved? I bet some of you even know the answer. Of course, it's John. It's written five times in the Bible that John was the disciple Jesus loved. Five times. Do you know it's only written in the book of John? <laughs> I'm sure he irritated all the other ones. It's like, could somebody else sit next to Jesus for once? You know, he always got there early, made sure he had his seat right next to Jesus, always kind of cuddled up next to him, you know, and, and wanted to hear everything he had to say. And, of course, you got Peter, who was pretty excited about what he was bringing to the table. But, but John just focused on the fact that God loves me. And at the end of the day, when the guy that always talked about what he was going to do was running for the hills, the guy that knew he was loved was at the foot of the cross. So, friend, if you walk out of here not knowing anything else but God loves you completely and without condition, that's enough. That's enough to keep you secure. And I think that that's unfortunately the very thing that religion strikes against. It strikes against that, that idea that there's nothing that can shake God's love from you. And that's a big one. That, that's a powerful one. So now we're moving on here. Um, it says here that um, verse 13, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed... You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now notice the progression there. After you believed, then you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now this is the book of Ephesians, one of the most comprehensive gospel articulations in Scripture. Like I said last week, only maybe second to Romans, just because the breadth of Romans is so extensive. It's very uh, surgical because it applies to every part of your life, even Jason's elbow and shoulder. And it's strategic because the whole point of this is so that we can live this truth from the inside out. God wants you to live inside out. Because what we're, what we're describing here is an absolute truth, but not everybody understands how to let that truth out. I heard Reinhard Bonnke say one time that, you know, there's a lot of people running around saying that they're going to defend the gospel. You know, that's, that's actually a definition of apologetics, which I'm not against apologists for sure. But he said, you know, you don't have to defend a lion. Just let him out of the cage. He'll take care of himself. If we just begin to live the truth that's on the inside of us, on the outside of us, people would see and hear Jesus. It's powerful. You know, he's probably referring to Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6 or 1 through 8. It says, while Apollos was at Corinth, now this is like 20 years after the resurrection of Christ, Paul went to Ephesus. He lived with these people for about three years. Then he left, and as he was imprisoned the first time in Rome, 
he wrote this book. And it's interesting because as you read through this, and obviously I'm not going to be with you to, to go through every chapter, uh, but as you read through this book, you'll see that he's speaking from somebody that has a relationship. I mean, you can only speak so much into a person if you don't have a relationship with them. But if, you, if they know you love them and they know you care about them, then they'll listen to you. And you can see that that's sort of how he's writing that. But when he met the Ephesians, he showed up in Ephesus and he found some believers. And he said, what did you first believe in? And they said, well, we believe unto John the Baptist. Well, these people were, you know, they, they were further out in the country than Quitman is because they didn't know Jesus had come and lived and died yet. They, didn't, they thought John the Baptist was still the message, you know. Repent of your sins and be baptized. So the Bible says Paul preached Jesus to them. Then they got baptized and then the Holy Spirit came upon them after they believed. So they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So I'm guessing that that's a reference to that, that episode there. And then it goes on to say in verse 14, the Holy Spirit is the intended subject here, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So he, he's the down payment. And this is uh, what the word there in the New King James is guarantee, but it means guarantee, it means down payment or earnest. So the fact that the Holy Spirit is here is proof that you'll someday live forever in eternity. But notice that he's also here to operate and function in the earth through us. I mean, you know the story of Peter. Peter's just going down to, to Bite Me Bakery from wherever he lives in central Arkansas. And all of a sudden, his shadow is falling on people, and he's getting, people are getting healed. It didn't seem like he had to gin anything up that morning. It didn't seem like he had to, you know, make a big deal about it. In fact, what I love about Peter, he didn't even mention it. He didn't try to explain it. He didn't write a book about it and try to get on Christian TV or even get on Oprah and try to tell everybody, this is how you heal people with your shadow. You got to do this, this, and this. He couldn't do that because he didn't do anything. He just walked to the coffee shop. But see, when you know who's alive on the inside of you, you are ready to be unleashed on a world that is sick and confused and depressed and suicidal and dying. Well, that sounds weird to me. Well, maybe we need a little weird in the body of Christ. I mean, I'd like that a whole lot better than just thinking God wants me to die because he gave me sickness. See, there's a lot of people in, in church today that think that everything that happens to you is God's idea. But the Bible says in the New Covenant that it's not God's will that any should perish without repentance. But that happens every day. You know what Jesus said one time to, to, to the disciples? And I think it was Philip. He said, Philip, how long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then in another place, he said, I don't do anything unless I first see the Father do it. I don't say anything unless I first hear the Father say it. And so don't you remember that one time where Jesus said, you know, I'm just going to leave you sick because I think you're going to learn a whole lot. And lots of people are going to get saved as, as you die a slow and agonizing death. Remember that time? What, what verse was that? Oh, he never did that, did he? Don't worry. There's no snakes in here today. It's not going to get any spookier than the gospel. Well, what if I pray for somebody and they die? You're not the, you're not the healer. You're the conduit. You ever got a drink of water on a hot summer day? We used to, when I was a kid, we'd play football in the yard of this Methodist church. And we knew that the side door was always unlocked. And they had this dark hallway and halfway down that hallway there was this water fountain that had the coldest water on earth at least if you were a eight year old kid in Mississippi but not once do I ever remember any of us saying man that is the best water fountain in the world it was the water that was so good 
It wasn't the fountain. You see, you're just the conduit. You're just the PVC pipe. Well, how do you do it? Well, Father, in the name of Jesus, your word says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So we just received your promise today in Jesus' name. You just prayed for the sick. So there are three takeaways I want to give you in the next seven minutes. There will be a miracle here today. You will see a pastor finish on time. We all know that's a miracle, don't we? <laughs> I found out a long time ago, if you'll be on time, people will come back. Three takeaways here. Number one, our sonship. Sorry, ladies, but we're also the bride of Christ, so take it up with Jesus. Our sonship is settled. No question ever about your sonship. It has nothing to do with your, with your behavior. Ephesians 1.5 is our reference there predestined as, uh, to adoption as sons. In Romans 8.15, it says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic word so intimate that the Greek, which is Koine Greek, that's what the scripture is written in, that's a language created and invented by Alexander the Great for his military, you know, infrastructure because it was such a specific language. And even the Koine Greek didn't have a word that was as intimate as Abba. And so here we find it in Scripture. So the spirit of adoption, what I find interesting in this passage, is the opposite of the spirit of fear. And it's interesting that the spirit of fear is what's gripped our world largely. And so this idea that the spirit of God is in us and that spirit cries out. It, it's every fiber of your being. I used to turn these kids loose at public school in the mornings and I would tell them, don't forget who you are. <laughs> that had lots of meanings, by the way. But one of them is you're a child of the king. And you're a child of me and your mom. And you're here on assignment. You're representing something more than you. I know that's a lot to put on a kid, and believe me. It wasn't overly done because <laughs> some of my kids, especially, you know, the, the male variety of our kids, tend to forget that kind of quick. But it was just something that I always wanted them to know because I think there's something inside of us as children of God that's, that's causing us to remember. Remember who you are. And notice that it's not you in this verse crying out, it's the Spirit crying out. Or no, he call, in this verse he causes us by whom we cry out. But watch this one in Galatians 4, 6. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart. So the first one in Romans 8, 15 causes us to cry out. The second one, the Spirit of God has been sent into us, and he cries out, Abba, Father. He's making a point here that what he's done in this relationship can't be undone. He could have he made it anything, but he made us his children because he wanted us to understand the connection. The second thing is his grace is our standard. It's not how good you can be. The Bible is not a self-help, behavior modification, do this and get that textbook. That's not what it is. This is a story about a relationship that will never change, ever. The, the, the foundation verse is there in verse 6 and 7, Ephesians 1. But let's go to John 1, 1, and then John 1, 14, and John 1, 17. We'll do it quickly here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among men, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay? And then verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came in Jesus Christ. Okay, or came through Jesus Christ. So understand it this way. The law was given 
grace and truth came. You see the, the, the dichotomy there. And I've heard people try to separate the grace and the truth, and it works pretty good, especially when you don't want to tell people that God loves you without any conditions at all. Because, you know, people might, like, like we said last week, people might start living, they might think you're giving them a license to sin. They might think you're a pastor that just winks at sin, allow, you know, encourages licentiousness. It doesn't matter what you do. God loves you anyway. But, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> That's true. This is the pushback on the unconditional love of God because they think that if people know that, they'll just go live like hell. But if anybody's ever lived like hell, and I, I have, you don't really want to do that. See, the problem in church with the, I, don't, I shouldn't say in church, the problem with the church, the ecclesia, the ecclesia of God, is this. We don't preach God's unconditional love enough. Because if you know you're loved without condition, that makes you gravitate to the source of that love. It doesn't make you flout that love. It doesn't make you disrespect that love. It's, it's an honoring thing. I used my wife as an example last week. She loves me without condition. We've been married 30 years. I didn't always look like this. It was easy in the beginning. You know what I mean? Easy. It's a lot harder in my estimation now for her to love me the same way. And because she does, that's impressive to me. It doesn't make me want to go act a fool. I'm less a fool now that I know that better 30 years down the road than I was in the beginning. And listen, that's how it is with God. As soon as you know how much he loves you, it will not make you run off. It will make you walk close because you want to be near him. But the fear is always the same, and that's what people push back on. But here's the thing. They'll teach, well, the, there is grace. Yes, that's right, Pastor Ken. Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. But there's also the truth. And the truth is, you better not get too crazy with the grace business. And, you know, they'll, they'll preach that up, and they'll make it look really fluffy and shiny and great. But you know what I've come to know? That grace is the truth. The truth is grace. And it never changes. It has no variation. It is. See, grace is getting what you don't deserve. And that is everything we read in Ephesians 1. That's grace. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Other side of the coin. But don't you love those people who say, oh, well, I'm, I'm just praying for justice, amen. You don't want to do that. <laughs> justice is getting what you do deserve. And even if you're good on Thursday, Friday's coming. You see what I'm saying? If this was based on our behavior, we'd be in trouble. Because we're always evaluating us based on somebody else. The standard is God. That's why the law had to be fulfilled, not abolished. The law had to be fulfilled through Jesus. Uh, last point. Number three, our inheritance is secure. Right now, our stock market is in shambles. Our politicians are telling us that we need to sacrifice uh, both sides of the aisle. So, you know, don't get mad at me for talking politics for a minute, but... They're telling us that we have to sacrifice for democracy in the world. In the meantime, Ukraine has never been a democracy. <laughs> um, but they're not sacrificing, not their finances, not their pension, not their inheritance. They're, they're fat and sassy. You see, your inheritance that matters is secure. Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We've, we've made that fact. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. Jesus doesn't want you to live your best life now. Oh, I, amen, brother. I knew that was true. Boy, I'm glad he finally said that. He wants you to live 
his best life now. What do you mean? Well, in John 14, 12, Jesus said, if you believe in me, I bet every one of you do. If you believe in me, the works that I do, you shall do also. And greater works than these. What? Greater works? That one turned my little Baptist head upside down. I was sitting in a tent in Somalia reading a little Gideon Bible that Sam Haley's grandpa gave me in 1987 because it's my grandpa too. Five years into my enlistment, I got sent to Somalia a month after I got married. And I'm thinking, you know, we had just started going to church because like a lot of people, religion had blown me out. I didn't go to church for years. But there was something in me because I was saved. And I started reading, you know, like any good Christian would. It was just the New Testament, so I, I, and it was also microscopic, so I, I would have trouble now. But I just started in Matthew. And by the time I got to John chapter 14, verse 12, I read it. I didn't know much, but I knew Jesus is Jesus. I knew the word of God was the word of God. I had no idea what it said. And I read 14, 12. If you believe in me, the works that I do, you shall do also. And greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. And I thought, nobody ever told me that. Nobody ever told me that. Why didn't anybody ever tell me that? You know what the Holy Spirit said? He goes, why didn't you ever read it? (laughs) You've had that Bible and that sea bag for five years. We need to know what the Word of God says because if we don't, We'll let the world lie to us, let the devil lie to us, and not know that we are carrying heaven every time we walk into a room. You don't have to be a weirdo to do this. You don't have to be some televangelist-looking strange person. I just feel like I'm carrying something that has residue to it. So I'll just, if you ever talk to me, I'll, I'll, I'll typically like shake your hand and I'll grab your elbow or something if you're a man or pat you on the shoulder. I, I'm not that, I'll just maybe do two hands with women but my thing is is the Bible says that there's some tangibility to this existence that we have my wife has a diffuser in just about every room stand to your feet I don't know what we did before essential oils but but you know the Bible says you're a diffuser of the fragrance of heaven you are your life is a diffuser of the goodness of God. Jesus did a lot of stuff and he said whatever he did, you're going to do greater things than those. You just have to trust him. So say, Lord, why don't you intersect my life with somebody that needs to know you this week? And you know, I know we were, a lot of us were raised where you were supposed to, you know, front people off and try to preach the gospel to them and you don't know them and it's uncomfortable for everybody, but If you just have a conversation with somebody and just sort of let it come around and it does it without you trying and just say, you know, I just feel like God would want you to know that he loves you completely. Or say, you know, I just think that, that, you know, you should know that God would want you to be well in your body. Well, how do you, how can you say that? My grandma died, mine did too. But my grandma is not my level of finishing here. The word of God is. So whatever we face, there's an answer. There's a promise. And you are the carrier of that promise. So I'm five minutes over. It's your fault, not mine. So let's pray and I'm going to turn you loose. But I just want to leave you that. Just go back to that verse in John 14, 12. Let it just kind of challenge you a little bit. The Holy Spirit's not weird, strange, or goofy, so you don't have to be either. Just be a normal you, because that's what's going to let people know that they can be a normal them. He loves you just where you are. So, Father, we thank you today for your goodness. Lord, thank you for the word that never changes. Thank you for your love that never changes. Thank you that you've called us 
on purpose for such a time as this, that you planted us here together, that you're challenging us in our thoughts and our beliefs, Lord, and you're strengthening us in our hearts. And we give you the praise today. If there's anybody under the sound of my voice that has never received Christ as Savior, listen, you don't have to leave your seat. Jesus said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the entire world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. If you can believe today, today is your day of salvation. When the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? He could have said anything. But he said to believe on the Lord Jesus. And then he promised over our families that, and you and your house shall be saved. Even our children have to make their own choice, but I, I think the Holy Spirit is committed to getting them to a place of choice. So Father, we thank you today. We honor you in this place. If there's anybody sick in this place today, don't let them leave before they receive prayer and agreement over their lives, Lord God, according to the word. And Lord, we give you all the praise today. We lift up our nation, our president, our governance, Lord. They need all the help they can get. And so we ask you to help. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We even pray for the people of Russia. I think of Paul the Apostle, who was Saul of Tarsus, going to persecute the church, and you showed up and interrupted his plan. Lord, interrupt Vladimir Putin. Interrupt those commanders on the ground. You have a plan for them as you do for us, and we thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout today.